um, the video to refer to later in case you missed something. So we are starting with slide 13, which looks like this. And hopefully you went through and figured this out yesterday. It was based on um, like the previous couple slides. We had the nucleotide slide that showed us, you know, that it's made of a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. Shows us where the hydrogen bonds are. And then um, this slide here, the next one was showing us that the purines are composed of adenine and guanine. They have two rings to them. And pyrimidines have just one ring structure to them, and that's thymine and cytosine. So based on that information, we should have been able to figure out uh, this compare contrast about purines and pyrimidines, okay? So as far as, uh, we'll go through this list in order. Adenine, adenine is a nitrogen base found on, uh, it's, it's just um, a purine because it has two rings on it. Cytosine only has one ring, so that's a pyrimidine, belongs on the right side. The next one down, deoxyribose, that's the sugar, as it's part of the sugar phosphate backbone. Every single nucleotide in DNA has a deoxyribose sugar, so that goes in the middle because it's common to both. And then we have thymine, that is going to be a pyrimidine, it's got one ring. The phosphate group, again, that is going to um, go under both categories uh, because it bonds to the sugar. It, it, like I said, is part of the backbone to DNA. The guanine is going to be a purine because it's got uh, the two rings. And then, as I just said, two rings goes with purines and the one ring goes on pyrimidines. Make sure you have those arranged correctly if you didn't. Yes. Hang on. The chart below shows the percentage of adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in the DNA of three different species of organisms. So what they did was they took DNA out of a grasshopper cell. Um, they put it through this special machine that can measure the, num the amount of these chemicals. Um, and they found for grasshoppers, there's 29-ish percent of adenine. 20% of guanine, 20% of cytosine, and about 29% of thymine. And they did that for wheat DNA, and they did it for rat DNA, okay? What I want you to do, you can pick any one of these three organisms, and you're going to write down the percentage of adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. So it doesn't matter which animal you or which organism you pick. Pick one of them to write down the percentage of their the different bases in their DNA. Then what I want you to do is look at the percentages and how it's distributed and tell me what is the pattern or the relationship between the percentages of each type of nucleotide. There will be a pattern and you can look at all of the organisms to see if that pattern is consistent, but there's a pattern that you're going to see emerging. Up to you folks at home, does anybody want to try and tell me what their pattern is that they noticed? What did you happen to see? What kind of relationship is there between the amount of adenine, the amount of guanine, the amount of thymine, and the amount of cytosine in DNA? Everybody find it. It's a little tricky, but let's take a look. I just picked the grasshopper just because it was the first one. Now, when I look at these numbers, um, and I'm going to make it just really simple on myself, I'm going to ignore the decimal points, okay? So if I take a look, I can see that adenine has 29%. Thymine, there's 29%. That's the same amount. And if I look at guanine, there's 20% guanine, and there's 20% cytosine. That's the same amount as well. And if you look at the wheat, Wheat has 27% adenine, 27% thymine. It's the same. Guanine and cytosine for wheat, 22 and 22, same percentage. That's the pattern that you should be noticing is that in any of these organisms, the percent of A is always equal to the percent of T, 
or very, very close to it. And the percent of G is pretty close to the percent of C. So that's the percentage that I wanted you to see because this is gonna help uh, Watson and Crick later with their model of what DNA looks like. So the number of adenine is equal to the number of thymine or the percentage. Same thing with the amount of cytosine is equal to the amount of guanine. So this is gonna lead to something called Chargaff's rule. Um, up in the top right hand corner, we're just kind of bringing what we just learned and kind of doing a little you know, memory thing up here. A, the percent of A is equal to the percent of T. Percent of G will equal the percent of C. Um, and Chargaff was a scientist. We're gonna talk about him again here shortly, but let's just look at this table. Um, we're gonna fill in uh, the percentages of thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine for each of these other organisms. Yeast has been done for you. So if you take a look, the amount of thymine is 31%, and that will be the same as the amount of adenine. And then we have the amount of guanine is 19%, and cytosine will be 19%. All of those four should total 100. So all of the organisms totals should be 100. You could probably fill those in right now. So to do these, this is going to require a little math. So let's take a look at the yeast, okay? We have thymine and adenine are both 31%. If we add them together, we have 62%, right? Um, if we subtract that from 100, that is going to give us 38%. And if you look, 19 plus 19 is 38, all right? So that's, that's kind of how this is going to work. So let's do the sea urchin here. We, they've given us the amount of adenine. And since we remember up here in the top right hand corner, the amount of adenine is equal to thymine, we know we can fill in thymine with 33% because it's going to be the same as adenine. Then they also gave us the amount of guanine. Guanine is 17%. And if you go right up here in the top right hand corner, guanine is going to be equal to cytosine. So we can fill in cytosine will be 17%. If we add these four numbers up, 33 and 33 is 66. And then 17 and 17 is 34. So all that told is equal to 100. <clears throat> These next two, we have even less information, but we can still figure it out, okay? So with E. coli, they're giving us 26% of thymine. So if we go back up here in the top right-hand corner, remember, thymine and adenine are equal. So if we have 26% thymine, we're going to have 26% adenine because they have to be the same. Now, this is where we have to do a little addition, subtraction. So we have to figure out, out of 100, because we know we have, we're supposed to have 100%, 26 plus 26, that's 52, okay? So if we take that 100 minus 52, that's gonna give us 48%. We're missing these both, though. So since we're missing two numbers, we take that 48 and we're gonna divide it by two. And that's going to give us 24 and 24. Do you see how we did that? They gave us thymine. That automatically we know how much adenine because it's going to be the same as thymine. That's 26. And then we have to figure out the other percentages out of 100. So if we add 26 and 26, that's 52. And we do 100 minus that 52, that gives us a total for these last two, which is 48. So we had to divide it by two to figure out what each one is going to be, and they have to be the same. It has to be the same number. I'm going to give you a minute to try and do the chicken sample. You're gonna work backwards from cytosine. They're telling you cytosine is 21%. You're gonna use the information in that top right-hand corner to help you, okay? So we have cytosine. We have 21%. And 
If we go up in that top right hand corner, we have that reminder that the amount of cytosine is going to be equal to guanine. So that means guanine also has to have 21% there. And because we're working with a total of 100, 21 plus 21 is 42. And when you'd say, and then, so that's 42. Um, we have to find out how much uh, total adenine and thymine. So we take 100 minus 42. And that's going to give us uh, 58, right? So we have 58, but we have to split it between thymine and adenine. So 58 divided by 2 is going to be 29. So this is how your numbers should have worked out for you. Now I will ease your mind. The Regents exam, I think I've seen this type of question or needing to figure this kind of information out. I think I've seen it twice in like 16 years. So the chances of you getting a question where you have to work these percentages out is very slim. But I like to practice a little bit just in case they throw one at you because you never know when when they're going to do something like that to you. So um, you don't have to stay and it would only be one question. I've never seen them like do five or six of those. OK, so Erwin Chargaff in 1950, he was the one who figured out that the percentage of guanine is the same as cytosine and the amount of adenine is the same as thymine. In any sample of DNA that he looked at, A was always equal to T and C was always equal to G. So they call that Chargaff's rules. Um, so he noticed this and, and they're now called Chargaff's rules. Chargaff's rules tell us something important about DNA. So I'm gonna give you another clue about solving the structure of DNA. Each type of nucleotide, so these four pictures here are the four different types of nucleotides. <clears throat> they, <coughs> excuse me, they can either form two or three hydrogen bonds with other nucleotides. So I've shown where they form hydrogen bonds with a dotted line. So over here you can see the T that has two hydrogen bonds. The C can form three hydrogen bonds. The G, even though it's upside down, you can see it still can form three hydrogen bonds there. And the A, the adenine, can do two hydrogen bonds. I want you guys to go to the next slide. And it should look like this. I want you to rearrange these 10 nucleotides to see if you can build one DNA molecule. All of the pieces have to be touching together, okay? They can't be all over the place. So you're going to use the information we've learned so far from part one and part two, and we're going to try and, and lay them out on this page. Now I'm just going to show you a couple things um, because they're not all straight, okay? Some of them are sideways. So like this adenine here in the top center, if you click on it and you grab the little handlebar at the top, you can swing it so that the percentage says, or the angle says zero, and you can make it upright again, okay? So you can set it so that it's upright. Now remember, the A has two hydrogen bonds here, and T has two hydrogen bonds. So I'm going to put the T next to the A, but the hydrogen bonds, the dotted lines have to match up. So I'm gonna have to flip the T upside down. So I'm gonna grab that handlebar, and flip it to it says 180. And then I can match up those hydrogen bonds, okay? Then the other thing that you're gonna have to do, I'm gonna grab, doesn't matter what order these go in, but you can see with each nucleotide, the sugar and the phosphate are bonded together. And remember I said, I want this to be one whole DNA molecule. So the phosphates and the sugars have to pair up next to each other. They have to bond together. So you're going to end up putting, uh, you've got phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, and it's going to keep alternating that way down each side. So I'm just kind of getting you started here, making sure that, you know, our A and T have the two hydrogen bonds. They're going to pair up. And then you're going to keep building one solid DNA structure. So I'm going to give let you guys spend another minute or two to 
move your pieces around and build your DNA. See what you folks at home are doing. If you have any questions, you need to unmute and ask. If you're really stuck, um, we can set up time to you know work one on one together. But you're making sure that you know the A's and T's are going to match up because they each have two hydrogen bonds. The G's and C's are going to match up because they each have three hydrogen bonds. Um, one side is going to look upright. You're going to be able to read the letters normal. And the other side is going to be upside down um, because you have to flip them around so all the bonds can match up to each other. And I just started with A and T and then a T to A. Um, it does not matter what order they go in. You just need to make sure they pair up correctly and that they're all in one row together or one column. So your final structure should look something like this. Again, it does not matter the order of the bases. Um, you could have, we started in class, I started with the A's and T's. Um, this answer key is just starting with the C, it's okay. All right, as long as your structure looks like this, that the, the bonds that have three hydrogen bonds, those are together, and the ones that have two hydrogen bonds, they're together. And then you want to make sure that phosphate sugar alternates all the way down on each side. Okay, and then it's then it's going to be a correct image. All right, so this slide says stop. Before moving on to the next section, please check your answer to the previous slide by deleting this box. The order of your bases is not important right now, just how you put them together. So if you delete the box, you're going to see very similar to what that last slide was, okay? And that's more for someone who's doing this not in class. Okay, Watson and Crick in 1953 were finally able to figure out what the structure of DNA looked like. So they built this 3D structure of DNA and they figured out it has this helix shape. It's got this spiral shape to it. Um, and it looks like a twisted ladder. I don't know if you've ever gone on a spiral staircase, um, but that's kind of what DNA looks like. It has that spiral look to it. Um, so DNA base pairing is going to be really important as far as keeping the width of DNA consistent. Um, and so the base pairing rules is going to show how the nucleotides always, always pair up with each other in DNA. Remember how we noticed that the percent of A is the same as the percent of T and the percent of C is the same as G? That's because adenine will always pair with thymine in the middle and cytosine and guanine are always going to pair up together. This is something you're going to have to memorize, okay? I, my little mind trick, um, the way I remember it, A pairs with T, so I remember acrid tigers and then G pairs with C, go cats. Acrid tigers, go cats. I have this little cheer in my head that helps me remember how they pair together. Um, there's another one here. Apples in the tree, A with T. Car in the garage, C with G. So whichever one helps you remember how they pair, just repeat it over and over in your head to get it you know, kind of burned in there. And uh, because we're gonna be doing a lot with base pairing, and if you remember how they pair now, Later on, when we do those other activities, it's going to be way easier for you to do. So either Akron Tigers go cats or apples in the tree, car in the garage, whatever is going to help you remember how they pair together. Okay, so now you're going to practice base pairing. So I want you to uh, remember either, either of those mnemonics, and you're going to click and drag uh, the things that are going to pair with A, G, C, and T over here. Reading that, either Akron Tigers go cats, or apples in the tree, car in the garage. So the first one, cytosine, that's going to pair with guanine. And you want to put it at the end of the, the lines there represent the hydrogen bonds again. And then we have adenine is the second one down. It's going to pair with thymine. Thymine will pair with adenine and then cytosine with guanine. So you should have TCGA in that order, the way they pair up. And then we're going to fast forward a whole bunch of years because now they figured out the shape of DNA, they're able to actually study it. In 1990, the international, like all scientists across the world, decided they needed to map out 
the human genome. So they started in 1990 trying to sequence all of the genetic information in human DNA. Now remember, our, all our DNA is the same as far as where the genes are located. You know, we, we each have different versions of the genes and different combinations, but our, I, our genetics are identical as far as where the genes are located. So that's what they were trying to figure out is where are all these genes located? Um, and it took them 13 years to figure this out, but they sequenced all of the human DNA in 2003. And I have a short video that kind of summarizes how they went about it. stuff that we still have to figure out. The key ingredients of our DNA are four chemicals, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These are called bases, and they pair up together to form long chains of base pairs. The orders of A's, T's, C's, and G's is super important because it dictates whether an organism is a human or a hackfish or something. Back in 1990, a bunch of scientists decided that if they could figure out the exact sequence of all the base pairs in the human genome, they can cure all the diseases. And so they started the Human Genome Project, and researchers from over 20 countries worked 13 years to do it. And when they were done, they sat back and were like, eh, eh, because don't get me wrong, there were surprises there, but they were a little less like surprise surprises and more like, oh, that kind of surprises. First, it turns out the human genome has a lot fewer genes sequences that actually code for proteins that make it new stuff than anybody expected. So I got my biochemistry degree in 2002. A long time ago, I recognized it. Not that long ago, in my biology textbook, when I was in school, said that there were between 80,000 and 100,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. And that was wrong, really wrong. There are fewer than 30,000. Some less complex animals have more than that, like a water flea has 31,000. Second surprise, not only do we have fewer genes than we thought, but they only make up like 2% of our genome. The project scientists politely referred to the rest as non-coding DNA, which meant they had no idea what the Watson and Griffin told. A third sort of lame surprise is that sequencing our genome hasn't helped us cure cancer or anything, which leads geneticists to conclude that our DNA is not the only thing that calls the shots when it comes to how our bodies work. But the human genome project has definitely changed the way that we study genetics. It's given rise to functional, Imperative genome fields that study the function of genes and how our genome compares to that of other species. And this new research has led scientists to discover that a lot of the non coding DNA in our genome has good reasons for being there. For instance, it turns out that a lot of our DNA came from viruses that invaded our ancestors' bodies thousands of years ago, and their, their genes just got stuck there, unable to evolve and unable to reinfect their hosts. It's like weird it's virus DNA. Also, some of our DNA contains instructions for making body parts that we don't have anymore. Like our genome hasn't phased out the instructions for growing a tail. During embryonic development, we no longer get to go ahead to actually grow one, but the directions for making one are still there. So a lot of what we've once thought was junk DNA is probably code for stuff that we just don't have anymore. So we're living in an exciting time to study genetics, and I haven't even talked about epigenetics, which is crazy, and some new research into evolutionary development biology, which we did old crash course episode one. <clears throat> it's all thanks in part to having sequenced the human genome. Thank you. Okay. So um just this is where I wanted to get up to. The summary and review is what you guys are going to work on tomorrow. Please make sure you go back into today's folder and do the exit ticket for today's lesson. Okay. I will put this video with um with the lesson so that in case you need to refer to it, it's going to be there for you. Um, but you guys at home can log off and we'll see you Thursday.